Hey, if you are watching this video on YouTube, we've got about 10 minutes till the official start of class. I just started early in case people get here a little bit early. Hey, Olivia, welcome aboard. We'll get started in about 10 minutes, so right at 12.30. If you have any specific questions, um, feel free to fire them away. Uh, it's why I show up a little bit early if people have questions. Otherwise, you can just kind of hang tight nearby, and we'll get started, like I said, in 10 minutes, but it's good to have you back. Hey, Sean, welcome back, dude. Uh, we'll get started in about, like, eight, nine minutes. And uh, if anybody's got questions out there, again, uh, that's why I, you know, show up a little bit early to see if people have specific questions from the practice. Otherwise, uh, hang tight or go grab a quick bite and uh, just be back here at 1230. We'll get started right then. Guys, we've got about five minutes. Again, uh, anybody arriving early, if you have any specific homework questions, feel free to privately chat that one on over. Um, just from the practice test, we can go over those. But if you don't, no sweat. There's no pressure. Um, that's just why I hang early. But otherwise, you can come right up to about 1229 each week if you have no questions. Or come on early if you want to just make sure that you log on early. That is all good. Whatever works best for you.
Sure thing. Okay. So I've got a request number 14 on section three. So let me grab that up and I'm going to go over that one. And we'll probably just have time just for that one problem, um, just with the time that we have remaining here, which is great. So let me grab that up. And then I'll share that one on over. All right, let me just get the share going here. Okay, okay. So hopefully everybody can see that. Well, like I'm just you're just watching me scroll right now. Um, if you're just logging on right now, uh, this is not part of class yet. So official class hasn't started yet. I'm just going over a a quick question here. Although I think I'm muted. No, I'm not muted. Great, awesome. <laughs> so let's. Funny if you had to check yourself whether or not you are actually muted. As a human being, that would be an interesting way to go about things. Yeah, number 14 is a higher level thinking problem for sure. And it is considered a, a harder level difficulty. Let me put that in the notes. So let me just kind of cut and paste that one on over. And then let me share on over this so that I can write on it. Here we go, guys. Okay, so let me put another bit in here. I'll put a slide right in between those two. Beautiful. All right, so uh, number 14 very difficult problem, huge in terms of what can I do. And again, if you're just joining us, uh, just a reminder, this is not an official part of class. I'm going over a homework question. Somebody came early and said, I got a question on number 14 from section three, which is the non-calculator section. Um, as far as this problem goes, it, well, let me find where my writing menu is. It has disappeared. Sorry, guys. I usually have my writing menu all up and ready to go. And it is not showing up on here. So I know I have it somewhere on the screen. My apologies. All right. Well, we'll start out going over that in a second, but it's bizarre. There we go. All right. Well, I can I can grab it that way. That's old school. Anyway, um, so looking at that problem, it's all about what can I do. And again, if you're just arriving, just going over a homework problem. Um, you're not missing anything and you're not late. You're early. So what can I do with this thing right here? Now, the first thing that I've got is I've got this equation. What can I do with that? I, I guess the only thing that comes to mind is solving for y because they love slope intercept form so much. That's what I could do. So that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to subtract 3x from both sides. So I have minus y is equal to minus 3x plus 12. That's just subtracting 3x from both sides. Then I'm going to divide by negative one on both sides. So divide by negative one. That'll flip the signs everywhere. That's going to give me 3x minus 12, like so. So now that I have all of that, I'm in pretty solid shape. Like I'm, I'm pretty happy with that, but there's nothing else I can do with it. So then I go on to this expression. And then the next question is, what can I do with that? Well, now that I've solved for y, what I could do is I could recognize that y is equal to that. So I could substitute this in for y, because that's really all I can do. This is another thing we can do with the 8 to the x, and we'll take a look at that one shortly. So I have 8 to the x all over 2 to the 3x minus 12. And now the answer choices themselves are expressions, but and I'm looking at them playing eye tennis. The only one that I would caution you against is guessing d. That's one of the worst guesses is like the does not exist or you know there is no solution or can't be determined. Don't guess that one. If you're certain that that's your answer, then that's great. But we're uncertain, so it's not a good guess. All right, let's keep looking at this. So looking at this guy, what I do know is that there's an exponent rule that they love testing on once per, per test. Now, that's the idea that if you have the same base, you subtract exponents and keep the base. The problem is we don't have the same base. So we wanna make that the same base. So this would be two cubed to the X. And again, this is considered the highest level of difficulty problem, like what separates the very high sevens um, from the low sevens. Okay, so now that I've done that, I have two to the three X over two to the three X minus 12. At this point, you might already see that A is your answer. You might not, and that's okay. But again, we've got the same base. We're gonna subtract our exponents. So that's gonna be two to the three X minus that upper exponent. And now I'm using my answer choices. And one skill you're gonna hear me talk about a lot today, segueing into today's lesson, is even if you know what your answer is, use your answer choices to kind of, well, just make sure that it's guiding you into the simplified answer, if that makes sense. So I'm looking at this saying, all right, I think two to the 12th is it. 
let me just double check, 3x minus 3x, that's what we have there. Minus a minus 12 is a plus 12. Oh yeah, okay, there's two to the 12 right there. Those will cancel. So don't just come up with your answer. Put your head you know, down to the paper or when you go to take the digital in March or beyond, just head on the computer and on your scrap paper. No way, you're gonna to wanna to be using those answer choices to help you home, even if it's just a matter of simplifying your answers. So two to the 12 final answer. And again, that is considered a super high level of difficulty problem, but I hope that that helped. It was a, what can I do special? All right, any questions on that one? I'm just gonna go turn on my overhead light here. There we go. I can get a little better shot of my ugly mug while I go over this stuff with you. Any questions coming across on that one? Okay, well, I hope that helped. To the person that asked that one, thank you so much for that question. That was a really good one. And I wanna just, again, let you know that that is a very high level of difficulty problem. And I hope that your first practice test went well. I do. I, I hope that, um, you know, your scores didn't overwhelm you at all. And remember this, this is what I'll start out the class with, and then we'll actually head into the notes for today. So what I'll start out by saying, let me unshare for a second. I'll start out just by saying that, well, first of all, I hope you're well, and I hope you had a good week in between, and I'm so stoked to be here. Uh, the second thing I'll start out with is, as you guys do these practice tests, remember, this is a long road for a lot of people. I don't mean long like many, many years, but many months usually. And it's all about consistency and not overwhelming yourself. So it's about making SAT practice a small part of your routine, 10, 15 minutes a day once our class time's over. You're going to be doing more than that per day during our class time. But outside of the six weeks, it's about resuming that really small but consistent amount of practice. So after the first practice test, second, third, or even fourth, if you're like, my scores aren't really going up that much, that's okay. Other people we've had in class, last class I had somebody after the first or second test, they were already up 100 points practicing at that rate. And that's great. Other people, it's like eh, incremental. It might even go down a little bit as you adjust to new ways of approaching a test, especially if you're in the mid 700s already. Then it's really just a matter of making sure that we get rid of our simple errors. So patience with yourself, kindness with yourself, and know that as you stick to this road, the scores end up going like this, up and down, but over time, up. But again, balance that with mental health and not stressing yourself out too much. So I'll start out class with that. And I'll start out class with this other really important strategy. So I always like to start out with like a general strategy, uh, test taking strategy. And this works on paper as well as the digital test version. So let me get back to this. Now, when you're taking the test, you are going to have many problems that you're like, all right, I know exactly what I can do. Or you know what to do right away. And that's great. You fire away, you jump into it. Awesome. But what happens when you come across a number 14 like this? And you're like, I don't know what I can do here. I don't even know where to start. So you, you always want to start out with that question. What can I do? Let's stop and immediately take that action if there's an answer to the question. When there's no answer to that question, give yourself five seconds, 10 seconds max. If nothing comes to you, you're like, dude, I, I don't know what I could even try here. That is a strong indication that you should skip the problem and come back to it. And so what I'm going to advocate for is a strategy that I never used when I was your age, because I just, it was hard for me to wrap my head around it, but I wish I would have forced myself to practice it. I really do. My scores would have been higher. Um, I mean, they were great, but they weren't as high as they could have been. And so the, my reason for mentioning that is I want you guys to save brain energy throughout the test. And you can do that with something called the two pass strategy. It's exactly what it sounds like. Um, it's not my strategy. This is a well-documented strategy that a lot of people advocate for. You go up to the problem, the what can I do part, that is part of my own. Um, and you say, what can I do? If there's no answer to that within five to 10 seconds, that is an indication that you should skip the problem immediately. Don't waste time trying to figure it out. Because in that 45 seconds to a minute to two minutes that you finally spent and to figure it out, if you do figure it out, you could have done two or three problems in that time without exhausting the brain. So you skip it, mark where that is, go and do the first problems that you know best. And then in the second pass, do a two pass strategy, you'll have time left to go back and do it. Because this the equal amount of time you're going to have, whether you go in order from one through whatever number you're going to, um, depending on the section, it's going to be the same amount of time if you go linearly like that, or if you do the two pass strategy. In fact, it might even be a little less time to do the two pass strategy because you're not wasting time perseverating over things. So anyway, just my tip 
if you're out there being like, yeah, that's going to cause me too much anxiety doing it that way. That's the one time where I would say, maybe don't listen to me on that strategy. Then, If you know that's going to cause you a lot of anxiety, just forget about it. All right, any questions on that? I wanted to start out with that general test tip that is called the two-pass strategy, as well as to remember to be patient with yourself as you work through these practice tests, that the scores, I hope, will be like this. But for most people, they go up, they go down, they go up, they go down, and then over time, they go like this. But it takes time because there's so many strategies, you know, Mr. Barth and I are throwing at you, and you need time to practice them and get them down. When you're patient with yourself, it works. It's proven to work. Um, so anyway. Just wanted to remind you of that, to be patient with yourself, because that's so important. Okay. All right. So let's jump back into the problems. So that was a great question that someone asked. And we're going to dive back into oh, systems of equations. Oh, yeah. So where we left off last week, we played a little bit of eye tennis at the end of our session. And we did eye tennis. We did some bad hip hop. We did a lot of what can I do, right? T, that taking early action idea. Um, and, you know, we also did a little bit of that counting on your finger math. Well, this one's going to be straight out of eye tennis and it's involving a type of problem that you're going to see probably two or three of, if not four, which would be a system of linear equations. So when you're given this kind of problem where they give you answer choices that are all equations, that is eye tennis and a half. So I want you guys to take a moment just to recognize the differences here and the similarities. You don't have to type those over to me, but I'm just going to say differences and similarities. And I'll list them out in a moment, but take like 10 seconds. Just go ahead and go through that drill. <laughs> Excuse me. You're looking at your answers and you're saying, what's similar? What's different? All right, so differences here, and that's really all that matters. You got this giant paragraph, that's what's gonna stick out. You've got your, really the placement of 25 and, and 75. Like if I'm gonna generalize it, that's what's in my head. And on the test guys, don't waste time jotting this down. Right, I'm just doing this so that you see the thinking and you have these notes for next time, which I'll send out in the email after class is over. But placements of, uh, let's see, 25 and 75. The similarities themselves, though, I mean, you're talking and placement 25 and 75, maybe placement of variables would be more general. Placement of variables. The similarities are the numbers themselves, 25, 75, 1.3, 165. Uh, and really, it's where did the FG go? Which is nice. Equal to 1600. That's all the same. So as we read, we're going to ignore a lot of stuff. All right, let's hit this up. The owner of a landscaping company is developing a proposal to maintain the grounds of the building. Nobody cares. Cross that John out. It is estimated at 75 gardening hours. All right, 75. I wonder what gardening. I bet that's G. Gardener, G. Yeah, okay. All right, so 75 G and plus 25 foreman hours. Okay, so now I'm going to stop because the question of what can I do can be answered. 75 G, 25 F. 25, no, mm -mm. 25F, 75G. All right, that's in play. 25G. No, we already canceled that. Okay, so that's out. 25F, 75G. All right, that's still in play. So now I play more eye tennis. It's about now recognizing the differences between what remains. F equals 1.3G and so on. G equals 1.3F and so on. So again, is it 1.3G or 1.3F? Is it F equals or G equals? Let's see. The total is 1600. We don't care. Don't care. It's in the same spot. Cross that out completely. We noticed it was a similarity. That's the power of similar things. You can ignore them. The hourly wage for a foreman, F, is equals, look out, 30% more than a gardener. F equals, F is, 30% more would be 100% plus 30%. You don't even have to understand the math, though. It's just even the F equals. You had me at F equals. B is your answer. It's not gardener is, it's foreman is. That's your answer. So again, notice you do need to rely on your skills for math translation and understanding word problems. However, you don't need to be able to translate out every bit of minutia. That's it, good problem. Uh, one other note on systems of equations. Sometimes they're the kind of problem where they gave you the words and it's which system matches with the words. Other times it's a problem and this will come in the grid in or in the multiple choice where they give you a word problem 
and it's find you know the total number of like the amount of money paid to the foreman so the wages for the foreman or find the wages for the gardener or both I've seen that as well all right so systems of linear equations especially for those of you in advanced math who haven't seen them in a while like if you're in calc right now you haven't solved these since the beginning of pre-calc if not just algebra 2 depending on your school's program so just keep that in mind it's a good thing to practice it's all over Khan Academy. All right, now that gets me into another huge but simple technique that I bet a lot of you guys are already aware of. And that's the idea that when you have any kind of equation at all, whether it's more than one like in here or a singular equation, I don't care how good you are at you know the mathematics itself. What I want you to be able to do is I want you to be able to, oh, there's that. I was looking for this box right here. Anyway, ah, I found it. Um, I, don't, I don't care how good you are at the math. I want you plugging and chugging. I want you plugging in. So what I'm going to type here, we'll go in the notes for, uh, well, indefinitely. When I see an equation, you'll never see more than two, by the way, or two. So never a system of three. That's insane. When I see an equation or two, and I am given answer choice. I put this in the first person so that when you read it back, um, you'll know to read it as yourself, not as me teaching you, if that makes sense. And I'm given answer choices. Plug and chug is my number one option. So even if you know how to do it, that's what I want you doing, especially if you're a high flyer, because some of you will be doing this with mental math with accuracy. Now, I am going to go over the math way, how to do this, because there are going to be tests that some of you will get where it's solve this and tell me what X times Y is the solution or X plus Y rather than just the solutions themselves. But if you're given solutions to an equation, you will be given quite a few of those. Plugging and chugging is the way to go. It's very simple. I look at these X, Y values and I plug them into the functions. That's all I'm doing. So three times zero using the top function here. Minus five times five. Does it equal negative 12? The answer is no, it, it doesn't. That's out. Okay. So it's got to work in both equations. Uh, negative four, three times negative four. And again, if you're a mental math person with accuracy, go for it. This is true. Negative 12 minus zero is negative 12. Okay. That doesn't mean it's right. It means you got to check the second one. Four times negative four plus two times zero. No, that is not going to equal 10. Nowhere near it. Okay. So that's out. All right. All good. And we keep going through it. Ah, three times one minus five times three. That is equal to negative 12. That's three minus 15. All right, let's do the next one. Four times one plus two times three. All oh, silky silky. Now we got ourselves a winner. We got four plus six is equal to 10. True story. That's your answer. That is quicker than eliminating, which is what I'm going to go over next. I wrote all that out and I'm teaching it. And it still only took like a minute to do. I only write it out because I want to show you the thinking going on in my head. If your mental math is strong, don't write it out. Keep it up there. If it is not strong, do write it out and still go plug and chuck. I'm telling you, it's the way to go. The only time I wouldn't do that is if the equation is like super fast to solve, like 2x minus 5 equals 7. Kind of quick. All right, so there's that advice there. Now, the math way, the reason why I go over this is you might see this as a grid-in problem or a multiple-choice problem that somehow makes it so that you can't plug in answers. Where it says, like I mentioned before, what is 2x plus y, where x and y are the answers. And they do annoying things like that sometimes. But you'll have plenty of times to exercise this idea right here. So to do the elimination, when I have 3x minus 5y equals negative 12, I'm going to use elimination as a strategy. And the reason why I'm going to do that is because I've got two variables on the same side of the equation, two equations, and elimination is the way to go. I'm going to eliminate the y's, but you could easily eliminate the x's. It does not matter. So to do that, I'm going to multiply top by 2, bottom by 5. And that leads on over to 6x minus 10y. So 6x minus 10y is equal to negative 24. 20x, oh, nice, uh, plus 10y, nice, those are about to eliminate. 5 times 10 is 50, beautiful. And we're going to add both those equations 
26 X equals 26 divide both sides by X. Sorry, by 26 to get X alone. X is one. Now, Lesson number two of the day. And I'm, I'm throwing a lot of ideas at you. I want to remind you, you don't need to get all this down tonight. Well, today, it's the afternoon. Today, you don't need to get it all down by the end of the week. But eventually, you will get all the strategies down with some consistent study that I talked about the onset of today. So please don't be overwhelmed. There's a lot of sling at you. X equals one. Now, the next piece of advice that I'm going to give you is do only as much math as is necessary. You're going to hear me say that a lot in the coming weeks. So I'm going to put that down here too. Do only as much math as is necessary. Now, the reason why that's important is twofold. The more math you do, the more chance there is for simple errors. Those of you high flyers out there, or really anyone at any level, you will get knocked down 30, 40, 50 points because of simple errors. There's nothing worse than making a simple error on a problem you know how to do. So, what we do is you look at your answer choices, and I mentioned earlier with the homework problem I went over, use your answer choices as you start to simplify and go through the problem. So I look at the X equals one and I think, well, gee, C is the only answer choice with X equals one. And I'm confident in my work. C is my answer and I'm out of there. Just save yourself 15 seconds, maybe even 30 seconds, depending on how long it takes to plug in X is one. That's it. Strong, strong advocate. Do only as much math as is necessary. I'm gonna keep saying that throughout today. All right, any questions from my peeps? That's you, you're my peeps. Any questions? I'll give them a moment to breathe and just kind of process what on earth we just did. None, no questions. None, zero, zip, zilch. Nothing coming through. Right, that's cool, that's cool. I'm checking the chat. So let's go on to the next one. Ah, Then we get to the harder level kind of system of equation problem. So what I've done is I've basically split up the types of system of equation problems that could happen. A word problem, a straight up solving problem, sometimes plug and chug, like I showed you, sometimes solving out. And then there's the higher level thinking problem. So. Couple things to review, and I'm gonna actually have you guys turn on your cameras briefly in a little bit. I'll let you know when, uh, just because we're gonna do like a little kinesthetic exercise. So when you have a system of equations, you are linear equations, you're talking about two graphs or one graph of two lines. And so you have three situations. You could have one solution when the two lines have different slopes. I'll just say different slopes. You could have no solutions when the slopes are the same. So I'll say slopes equal, the y-intercepts are different. Meaning the equations aren't identical, but both lines are either rising or falling at the same rate. They're parallel. And then finally, you have this other situation where you have two lines lying smack on top of each other. This is infinite solutions. And this is slopes and y-intercepts equal. Same equations. So these are the three situations. So I want you to turn on your cameras briefly. You don't even have to show your face if you don't want to. You can just show hands doing it. That's fine. And I want you to just actively do this out. Because in this kind of a problem, it's telling you that the system, uh, you've got this A is a constant, which by the way, ignore. Anytime it says it's a constant, while that does mean something mathematically, as far as the SATs are concerned, just be like, all right, cool, it's another variant. I guess I got to know something about it. And then it says, for which of the following values of A does the system have no solution? So the mention of number of solutions and a system has me thinking slope. That's what I want you to think. And again, yeah, it's overwhelming. I'm throwing a lot of specific content at you. It's studied over time and over time, you'll lock it all down. You will, it's like a checklist. That's all I'm giving you. Just have to practice the checklist and practice more and more. All right, so go ahead and turn on the cameras. Um, if you're super uncomfortable turning on, that's fine. Um, but just at least be doing the activity behind the scenes. So number one, I just want you to hold up your arms like this or hands and just go, no solution. 
Just remind yourself, or sorry, one solution. So just go like that and go one solution, one solution. Just remind yourself of that one solution. Perfect. All right. No solutions. No solutions. Go ahead and say that to yourself. No solutions. All right. Same slope. No solutions. And bam, infinite solutions. Sorry to clap right by the mic. Infinite solutions. Awesome. Thanks. You can leave the mics or leave the cameras on or turn them off, whatever you're most comfortable with. Rock on. Nice job. Thank you, dudes. So that's the main idea right there, y'all. That if you're asked for number solutions and you're given a system, it's about the slopes. So this is a high level problem. It's considered difficult. But when we know how to translate it, it's no longer got the teeth that it once had. So they want to know the value of A where we have no solution. But I look at this, say number of solutions and say, I got to find the slope of each. All right. Well, Y equals MX plus B, there it is again. I'm going to add 3X to both sides. I get Y equals 3X plus 6. Okay, so we have that. Awesome. The slope is 3. We know that if this line is to make no solutions with that line, that means that they must have the same exact slope. Sweet sassy malasse. Let's get there. So I'm going to subtract AX all towards getting my slope. That is all that's in the front and center of my prefrontal, well, my frontal cortex, where I'm thinking, yeah, I want Y. So I subtract AX from both sides. Then I'm going to divide by two on both sides. Beautiful. Everything gets divided by two. And hey, look, there's our slope. I don't care about the y-intercept. I care that I've got my kidney bean-shaped slope right there, and then another slope. And I set them equal. Why am I setting them equal? Because again, there's no solutions, and the slopes are equal. All right. You might happen to notice that the y-intercepts are not equal, which is good. OK, remember what I said before, and I'll say it again and again. I've got an easy equation to solve here. But in aiding you with your simplification, like all of us should be able to solve this with no problem. But use your answer choices. All right, LeBron James, one of the best basketball players to ever play the game. He's not going to be like, I don't need a backboard. He absolutely is going to be like, yeah, great, backboard. Don't take that backboard off. I might want to hit the bottom of the net every time, but why not have that extra aid? That's this. You might be able to hit this problem 10 times out of 10, but why not be extra certain you're not going to make that weird error under pressure? So you multiply both sides by negative two, we could do that, and you'll get negative six and get right to your answer. But I like looking at it this way and saying, my answers can't be positive because I got the negative there. And it doesn't make sense for my answer to be three because it's already three and we're going to take an action on this side to get rid of all this. So I know that I'm going to end up with negative six. Now, do I go through all that thinking? No. I do that within the span of a second or two. I look over here and say, can't be positive, can't be negative three, it's gotta be negative six. Yes, that makes sense when I multiply by negative two. Might it take an extra half a second to second or two Then had you just solved it? Yes, yes it might. But a second or two is insurance that you are doing this right and using the massive advantage that you're given in being given a multiple choice problem. And by the way, I invite you to use this strategy for those of you taking any kind of AP exams, the ACTs, or any kind of multiple choice exam at all that involves numbers, this is the way to go with a multiple choice exam so you don't make simple errors. So those of you in econ, those of you guys in stats, those of you in uh, calc, um, pre-calc, whatever you're in with numbers, please use that strategy. It's very helpful. It's insurance. Okay, so uh, any questions to there? All right, we are cruising. We are cruising. So uh, this problem I started putting on like two years ago or so, uh, it's on the most recently released practice test, which was an officially given test. This, to the best of my knowledge, is still the most current test that was ever administered that has been legally released um, out there. I don't go over any illegal resources. You know, somebody snaps somehow, gets a picture of a test. They're out there on the internet. Um, they get taken down by the college board and you can get in a lot of trouble. But this is an publicly released practice test that was actually given and they started showing up absolute values, started becoming a thing again. So I need you guys to remember how to solve these. And for some of you, it's not that it's hard, it's that you haven't done this in years. So let me just review it briefly. This is a grid-in problem. Your grid-in problems will look the same on the November, December test as they do when we go over them and in your practice test. They will look different on the digital test. Um, where you're able to type in more, you will be able to have negative answers um, in the digital test. You cannot have negative answers in the November, December test. 
They don't have that in the bubbles. So you have the absolute value of anything, just any number, I'll call it stuff, equals, we'll say a positive number. The way to solve this is very simple. And it breaks my heart to not go over the why behind it, because those of you that know me know that I adore the why, and I don't teach without teaching why and having my kids discover it. That's not what SAT is about. It's just about, here's the playbook. This is what you do with this situation. Recognize the situation, make the play. Recognize the situation, make the play. So stuff equals a positive number. Or, so you're going to have two equations. Stuff equals the opposite of that positive number. I'm going to go over how to solve this one. It's very simple. Um, keep this in mind. If you have the absolute value of stuff equals a negative number, there's no solution. That's because the absolute value is stuff's distance from zero. Distance is never negative. Now, if it equaled zero, you would just be solving one equation because the opposite of zero is still zero. So you can do it for zero. All right, let's apply this idea. So the absolute value of 2x plus 1 is equal to 5. Using this roadmap, we take 2x plus 1 and we equal it to uh, 5. We take 2x plus 1 and we equal it to negative 5 you'll get two solutions. Notice they're doing this annoying thing where they're saying, if A and B are the solutions to the equation, what is the value of that? Okay, it's weird. I know. Follow what they're asking you to do. We subtract one from both sides, 2x is 4. You divide by 2, x is 2. Um, and then this one, subtract 1, 2x is negative 6, divide by 2, x is negative 3. Now, the question that some of you might have is, how do I know which is A and which is B? They will indicate to you if there needs to be a difference. Because they did not give any kind of indication of what A or B should equal, like they didn't say A is a positive number and B is a negative number, then this would have to be an FBA. And it doesn't matter which is which. They've set it up in such a way that it doesn't matter which is which. So I arbitrarily call that A and call that B. And I do what they tell me to do. Absolute value of A minus b. 2 minus negative 3 is 5. Absolute value of any number is the positive version of that number, plus it's 0, and that's going to be 5. That's your answer. All right, let me pause there. A lot that we're going over. We are hitting a lot. Think of this as like condensing down. Probably we'll go over 12 or 13 problems each day. It's 12 or 13 mini math lessons. It's a lot. Your brain should be reeling. Well, hopefully not hurting up. Any questions? Preguntas, si o no? All right, nothing coming across the chat. If you're ready to go on to the next one, I'd like you to say, ready. So go ahead and turn on your mic just real briefly and say, ready. 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 Me too. Okay, let's go. Remember, uh, everything that is written down on here will be in your notes. Uh, hopefully, you guys are getting those emails uh, coming across at you. If not, email me and be like, I didn't get that email. Um, and you'll be getting two emails a week. Uh, one, either later Saturday or on Sunday. Next week, just quick things so you guys know. Next week, you guys will have, it'll be all verbal next weekend. Um, and then the following weekend will be all math. Sometimes we have to do that depending on schedules and how things work out. Um, so I'll be posting stuff on Sunday afternoon or evening, the recording of class and the notes and everything like that. Um, but just remember, all the recordings are there and they'll be there for you long after class so that if you're like, dude, they go over so much, I'd like to kind of watch back some stuff. So if you have any weak parts, problems that you're like, ooh, this is tough, kind of note on your watch or on your computer or whatever device you're on, what time it is, and maybe get a little log and you're like, well, okay, at one o'clock, which is 30 minutes into the second class, I had trouble on the problem and then that way you can skip ahead in youtube and go right to it all right because those those um videos will be up for you at least until the um december sat exam at least until the administration that okay all right so now guys I mean, we finished up the heart of algebra part that's 30 percent of all the math problem types we have gone over all the major problem types from your algebra one your slope intercept form your inequalities doesn't mean we've hit every single problem and how it's going to be presented, but we've hit every major math idea and all the strategies that are entailed uh, in math part. So now we're going to head into what is called passport to advanced math. Um, in the digital part, they're just really calling it, I think they're calling it advanced math, something along the lines. They've changed it to a different name. 
It doesn't matter. Here's what matters. This constitutes 30% of all the math problems on the current exam and slightly more than that on the digital exam. So need to say really important. Uh, the kind of math problems that are going to be on here are late algebra one, factoring, foiling, quadratic formula, um, exponent rules, as well as algebra two, select algebra two problems. You're talking not logarithms, by the way, parts of rational expressions. That's where you have fractions with variables in them, like just how to do them a little bit, asymptotes, that sort of thing, but just vertical asymptotes. And remember to do horizontal. Exponential functions, um, parabolas and polynomials, and I guess systems of equations a little bit, which we'll go over. We're gonna go over it all. All right, so that's where we're at right now. That's the second packet that we're diving into, and we won't finish it today, we'll finish it next week. The first thing I'm gonna put out there is, I'm gonna ask you guys to please privately chat on over to me, our first response. Privately chat on over, please. What do you do to solve an equation of this format? You've got stuff times stuff equals zero. What can I do is all over this. Like I don't read the problem. I immediately solve this because that's what I can do. And it's quick and it's a grid in because there's no answer to it. So please privately chat on over, type on over to me. What do you do when you're given an equation of this form? A times B equals zero. There's one thing you should do right away. You can use just a couple of words here. Okay, good. Good, good, good. Yep, awesome. All right, so a couple of people have written over to me um, to you can foil. I'm going to talk about that in a second, but the preferred method is taking each of these pieces and setting them equal to zero, A equals zero or B equals zero. So this idea here means that before I even read the problem, I'm setting each part equal to zero because it's such a fast action that I can take. Why not do it? So I add three to both sides, two X equals three, divide by two, X is three halves. I subtract four, X is negative four. I don't know what I need to do with the, that information. I just know that I can do it. So you answered the call of the question you're gonna ask almost every problem you ever get presented with in life. What can I do? Well, that's what I could do, let's keep reading. Let X equal A and X equal B be the solutions to the equation above. They didn't indicate that A had to be negative or positive. So we don't know which is which. So like in the last problem, doesn't matter. Arbitrarily, A and B. You can switch it. You get the same answer. What is the value, <coughs> excuse me, of minus A minus B? All right. We're going to do what they say. Minus 3 halves minus A minus B. So now from here, I just simplify. So negative 3 halves minus a negative 4. Um, so it's going to be negative 3 halves plus four, uh, and then just be careful here. That's gonna be eight halves. That's what I'm looking at mentally. And negative three halves is five halves. Keep things improper. On the written exam, no mixed numbers. The digital, we'll have to see what the digital formatting is like, whether they allow you to do mixed numbers. But I mean, as a rule of thumb, guys, mixed numbers are dumb. <laughs> they really are. We've been teaching that to my sixth graders. The improper fractions are so much more user friendly. This is only great if you're measuring stuff, which is important in life. Sure, I'm not gonna totally, but I mean in mathematics, this is what you want. So two point five or five halves is your answer. But again, the what can I do is the main part here, and that's understand a set each equal to zero. Now, a note about foiling: if you said you should foil, don't feel bad. If there was no equal sign, that is the what can I do that I want you to think of. Foil, absolutely, foil is what you should do if there wasn't an equal to zero. Since it's equal to zero, presumably we're solving this job. All right, any questions at all? All right, let's keep firing, let's go, let's go. Nice, I hope you guys are feeling it today. I am, the sun's out, stop taking a nap. It's good, it's been a couple of days, man. All right, so. What are the solutions to that equation is what it's asking. And I tennis is going to help here, but so is the idea that I introed earlier today, which is do as little math as is necessary. So, so much of this, even for those of you, and I mentioned this last week, a lot of you, strong math people out there. That's great. Some of you, maybe not. And that's okay too. And everybody in between. 
Those of you that are your AP calcers or the people that are already through AP calc and you're in multivariable, which is cool too, if you're that kind of a beast. I love it. Um, yeah, this still helps. So a lot of you are going to look at this and be like, I know how to solve that, Mr. Grant. I don't need you to go over this, but should do. <laughs> and here's why. Here's why. If you learn to save brain energy and cut down on simple errors, you are going to spend less time on the test and have a higher score. That's not rocket science. So these strategies aren't necessarily, and nor is this class really about showing you how to do the math. I bet a lot of you guys know how to do almost all of the math on every single problem. It's about knowing one, oh, that's the math that's being tested because some of the problems are weirdly worded. And two, okay, I do know how to do the math on that problem, but I wouldn't have thought to have been efficient in that way. And sometimes maybe you will think that way and that's fine too. But let me show you just how fast we can be here. Now the answer choices indicate to us quadratic formula. You do need to know your quadratic formula. It is an expected formula. It is not a part of the formula sheet. So the opposite would be a plus or minus square root B squared minus four AC all over two A. Now, what all this represents are the coefficients, the numbers in front of the variables in any what's called a quadratic equation, which is an equation of this form. To solve for x, you literally just plug a, b, and c into that formula. It's beautiful how to derive that formula, but it's not what this class is about. So all you do is you take those values and plug them in. So you have a, you have b, and you have c. But wait, there's more. Do as little math as is necessary. Don't you dare plug everything into this formula. Because if you look at your answer choices, look at the differences. Each and every expression has a different number here. Negative 5 halves, negative 5 six, positive 5 six, positive 5 halves. Same on this part too. Huh. The 145 is the same everywhere. The 2 and the 6 are different there too. We got a lot to eliminate. Namely, just that first number. So if I just get the minus b over 2a, that's going to give me this. So that's all I got to do. So the minus b is minus 5. Plus or minus the square root. You can plug in there if you want, but you know it's going to be 145. Why waste the time? The worst thing you could do, by the way, and here's where the simple errors come in. There's a lot of simple calculations that can go wrong. You do it out. You'll have a calculator, possibly on a problem like this, possibly not for the uh, November, December exam. Digital, it's all calculator. You do this out and you'll be like, ah, oh, none of my answer choices match because you're just looking at your, your work and then you look up and you're like, I think you're 145. Crap. I got to go back and fix your mistake and then panic could set in. No, use your answer choices. They're there for you. Two times A, two times three, but six. Ah, nope. Not, not positive, negative five, six. Did you have to know to apply the quadratic formula? Absolutely. You needed to know it. You needed to know how to use it. But what I'm teaching you is you don't need to know how to use it like you were taught in a math class like mine, like actual math class. You need to know how to use it in SAT land, in ACT land as well, by the way. this All these strategies work for both tests. Okay. I'm just using the SAT almost to go over these strategies. Just a word to the wise there. If you're also taking the ACTs, all these strategies work. They're great. They're awesome. Okay, so let me know if you got questions. I got another coming across in the chat. I'm checking that. But oh, and you can ask me a question five questions ago. You'd be like, I got a question from a while ago. No problem. Dudes, bad hip hop time. Remember that bad hip hop is great for a word problem where you have a variable. And we want to translate the situation into something that is less wordy. So here we've got an equation that looks a little well, sparse, actually. It doesn't have much to it. But there's a word problem. And there's too many words here for me to even entertain playing eye tennis. So let's read. The rule of 72 estimates the time, T of R in years, needed for an investment to double. It's going to be a mouthful, but so I think T of R. Time needed for investments to double. T of R, time needed for investments to double. So that's what I'm looking at. Okay. Annual interest rate, R percent. Annual interest rate, R percent. Okay. Which of the following is the best description of the number 72 in this context? What can I do with that? Like, I don't know. 
I don't know. So we're going to go through and we're going to eliminate. 72 is the time needed for any investment to double. Hold on. Time needed for investment to double. And the word is. 72 is T for any investment. Um, 72 is not always going to be T. It depends on what R is, right? So that's out. Do you see what we just did there? We took the context of investing in the rule of 72 and basically now made it into something that is not at all about investment. It's just about translating words based on bad hip hop. 72 is the number of years needed for an investment to double. All of that means 72 is T when the annual interest rate, so when R is one. Let's plug in 72 over one equals 72. Done. That's bad hip hop. That's powerful. Can you imagine Braxton, Alex, Sean, Ava, Olivia, Reed? Can you imagine if the SAT instead said, here's a function. What's the value of T when R is one? That would be so simple. Yeah, it is that easy when you make the translation. When you have these strategies, it's that easy. And that brings me to another point. If you ever get, and I'll, I'll type this out for you to remember, we all suffer from uh, you know, doubt every once in a while in our life. Maybe not often. Some of us more than others, some of us less than others. But it creeps up on all of us. There is no room for doubt on the SAT, especially with math. So if you say it can't be that easy, the reaction must be it is because I know how to do the problem. Because I know this. You got to be demonstrative. Because once you figure out the translation, the problems are that easy. The math is not hard. It's figuring out what strategy or what math technique to use that can be difficult. That can be the hard part. So don't doubt yourself. If it's easy, it's because you know it. And that, by the way, is something you can use in all your classes too. The only room for doubt in a class is if you have actual reason to doubt. Like, ooh, you know, the answer should be negative because if I'm looking for the amount that's decreasing, it would make sense for my answer to be less than zero. Okay. Then if you get a positive answer, that's a reason to doubt. But a reason to doubt isn't, ooh, that was too easy or that doesn't feel right. Only kind of feelings in math are excitement and joy and some boredom sometimes, which you might be experiencing right now. I hope not too much of it. All right. So let's check this one out, y'all. If you're ready for this next one, I want you to turn your mics up and say, bring it. Bring it. Bring it. Bring it. Bring it. Yeah. Let's go. It's been brought now. Oh, it's on. Here we go. Vertex form. This is another recognition, meaning you should recognize what vertex form is. You don't need to understand why it works. You do need to understand it and the things that the SAT peeps, the college board, will be testing you on. So when you are given something of the form y equals a times x minus h squared plus k, there are a few things you need to know. Number one, the graph of this will be a parabola, a U-shaped curve like that. It will have the vertex h comma k. It could also be facing down. More on that in a moment. Again, the vertex h comma k. It will have an axis of symmetry. That is the fold. Like if you could fold one side of the parabola onto the other, that will be x equals whatever the x value of the vertex is. So x equals h. And last but not least, if a is greater than 0, that thing is facing up. If a is less than 0, it is facing down. That would make it have a maximum, by the way, that's facing down. And here we have a minimum facing up. Visualize it. Don't memorize all those facts, but that's it. So when you see vertex form, they're testing you on one of the things I just went over, either the direction the thing's facing, the axis of symmetry, it being a max or min, or the vertex, or several of those all at once. So I read this problem, and because I've studied my notes every week, right? And every day for a couple of minutes, that's part of your routine, studying your verbal and math notes just for a little bit. Doesn't have to be all your notes. Just pick up on a strategy or two that you haven't picked up on and just lock it in. Uh, make it a goal to lock in three strategies a week. You can do that. It accrues very quickly. 
So looking at this then, that's a strategy. I look at that and I say, okay, A is less than zero. All right. So it's facing down. I haven't even read the word problem yet because I'm asking, what can I do? Well, that's the answer is a lot. I know that my vertex X minus H is 25 comma plus K, 625. So I already know that this is a maximum. I know that the axis of symmetry goes through X equals 25. I know that it's facing down and I know my entire vertex. Whatever they're about to ask me, I know the answer to because this is all they test. The area A of X of a rectangular enclosure that can be made from a limited amount of fencing is shown above. Can't really do much with that, right? Where X is the length of one of the sides. Okay, so X length of sides, A is area. What is the maximum area? So A, remember that's your Y value, that's your output here. So what is the maximum Y value that can be enclosed? Because we already knew that they were testing us on a parabola and then face down and that it's the maximum, that is the maximum Y value. This is this point. So the Y value that is biggest, the area, is the Y value of the vertex. Done. And you would grid that in. You would grid that in. In the digital version, it will just be syntax. You have a place where you can type it in. All right, let me pause. Any questions there? Vertex form, big. You're going to see a problem like that. It's a lock. Guaranteed, you're going to see one. No questions. Right, all right, all right, all right. Here we go on the next one. Next up. Ooh, another vertex form problem. Yeah. So we got ourselves a vertex, and we have yet more things to notice, and I hope your brains are hanging in there. We're coming up on a break here, like 12-ish minutes, and then Mr. Barth will take over. So this says the graph of the function f in the xy plane is a parabola. You don't say. <laughs> Cross it out. Cool. Which of the following defines F? In other words, which function matches with that? We could have recognized that just by playing some eye tennis. Now play some eye tennis if you like, but the other thing we should recognize in perusing our answer choices is that Y is equal to A times X minus H the quantity squared plus K. All right, so we have that. Now, from here, what we also have to recognize is that you are given the vertex. So let's build it. X minus three squared plus one. So anything with X plus three is out. Now, some of you might even be able to say, well, you know what? This means shift the graph to the left three. So if you're good with that, that's great. That is almost never tested on the SAT. I say almost never because it would be like one of those fluke hard level problems. The vertex form is tested. So you could go that route. Now I look at the two remaining answer choices and I think, what are the differences? I tense. I've got plus one in both of them. It's just a four versus no four. So how do we figure out what's going on there? Well, there's a couple of things you can do. And one main idea that I'm going to throw out to you, and I was going over this with, I teach just an eighth grade class as well as mostly sixth graders. And I went over this with them because it's so fundamental. We're learning how to graph lines. Um, and I said to them what I'm going to say to you, points on a graph are more than just locations. They're like the history of what was plugged into a function. So if there's a point on a graph, an X, Y point, that indicates to you that if I plug in that X point into whatever function that graph is made from, I will get out the Y value. So points are more than locations. So points are more than locations. They also tell me to plug in X and Y into the function from which a graph, oh, Hope that wasn't too pretentious, but from which, but don't like to end with a preposition if I can help it. Anyway, so joking aside, plug in a point. That's what I'm getting at here. There's a lot to plug and chug. And guys, this tip is massive, is a massive strategy. I have seen some practice tests, which are old official exams, where you can get like 40 or 50 points from this, four or five questions on it, meaning... I look at this, I say two, five, four, five, I'm stuck, don't know what to do, or maybe you do know what to do. I'm gonna plug in, I'm gonna plug in the smaller numbers. Y, X, so that's five. A times two minus three squared plus one. You're gonna be able to solve for A, which is what we need. All right, we'll throw it in. Uh, five is equal to negative one squared is one times A is A. 
that is very clearly not going to be the one that's out there. It's going to be four using my answer choices. A is my answer. By the way, you also could have just plugged in these points into each answer choice, but you'd have to recognize, unfortunately, but in this plug and chug, there'd be several equations where two five might work in. So the correct answer is the one where all three points work in it. That's a lot of guessing and check. All right, let me pause there. A lot that just went out into your noggins. Any questions at all? Give me a minute to catch your breath. I am hyped. I love these problems. Doesn't matter how many times I do them. I just, I love giving you guys these tips. They're, it's cool. It's kind of different. I hope that this is a different way of looking at tests. And some of this stuff you might be like, yeah, I, I could have figured that out. Cool. That's awesome. Then and it's a validation of how you approach things. I want to remind you, though, sometimes when you do these new methods, it's going to fight against your natural instinct. Like my natural instinct to solve some of these problems is not to do what I'm teaching you. I had to fight against my natural instinct to create this curriculum and to continue to create better and better ways to approach the SAT. Because my natural instinct is just solve the darn thing. And that's not always the best route, right? So we look for the weaknesses in the armor of this SAT and we go after it, All right? Now, another, not so much weakness, but strategy that everyone should have when you're taking a big test on something is being able to narrow down the file folders in your head of where you're going to find information. What I mean by that is, if you can look at answer choices like we did in the last two problems, last few actually, and you're like, ooh, it's quadratic formula, or ooh, that's vertex form, or ooh, in this case, it's exponential form. You immediately take all the files in your head. Imagine that it's like a file drawer, just like in um, just like in your computer, like a Mac or a PC. And you got all these files, you're in Google Drive, and you're like, oh, where, where in this massive drive do I look? Oh, vertex form. Oh, they're asking me about the vertex. You go immediately to the information you need before the problem has even finished being read. That's powerful. So that's why I teach you all these recognition skills. So this one is recognizing that it's exponential form. They love exponential form. You will get a problem on it, if not two, possibly even three, but usually not more than two. That's a large chunk of the exam when there's 50-ish questions on the test, a little bit more. A times B to the X. Here's what you need to know. You need to know that A is the Y-intercept or the starting value. You need to know that. You know, need to know that B is what is known as the growth or decay factor. I'm leaving a bit of space here for a reason. And X is often the time that goes by. It's not as important. Now, you'll have growth when the B value is more than one. You'll have decay when B is less than one. It's going to be greater than zero always. It's never negative, but I'll just say less than one to make it easier. If it's growth, then you take, to find what B is, you take one and you add on to it the percent as a decimal. So I'll say as a decimal. And if it's decay, you take one and you subtract the percent as a decimal. Sometimes it's even told to you like the population doubles, then B would be two or triples, it'd be three or quadruples, it'd be four. Um, the reason why you're adding one to it is, let's say that you have uh, you know, a, a money market account that's earning, I mean, these days they earn close to 5% interest between four and 5%, which is crazy. But let's say it's earning 5% interest. The money that you want to be compounding and being calculated isn't just the interest, it's the interest on top of the 100% that you have in the bank. And then you add on to that the 5%. The one minus makes sense as a decay factor because if you are losing a population at 2% per year, you want to know what the population is. So you don't just take 2% of it and then subtract it. You can do that. You could say, well, 2% subtracted from 100 is 98. So if I lose 2%, I still have 98% of it. So you're doing the 98% calculation. Let me show you what I mean. All right. So it's between these four answer choices. We see that this says that we're going up by a factor of 310 per whatever T represents. This means that we're going down by 1%. And this means we're going up by 1%. Right away, we have recognized the kind of equation and been able to make a translation. Let's see where that fits into this novel. Keith modeled the growth over several hundred years of a tree population by estimating the number of the tree's pollen grains per square centimeter that were deposited each year within nobody cares. <laughs> you can't do anything with it. What can I do? The answer is no. He estimated there were 310 pollen grains 
per square centimeter for the first year. This is the start. That's what that indicates to me. It's the y-intercept. This is not in that position. This is in the B position. So that's out, that's out. So it's between these two. Is it a loss of 1% or a gain? Once we get to that, we're good. Within a 1%, with a 1% annual increase, done, and I'm out. Let me read the rest of it. I mean, the rest is just going to confirm which of the following models the situation. Isn't that beautiful? It's beautiful. You know it's beautiful. Come on, Sean, Alex, Braxton, Reed, Olivia, and Ava. You know it. You know it's beautiful. All right. So any questions on that? I'm going to have fire and a lot of information at you. I recognize that. All right. So let's hit up one more. I'd like you guys to try this one. We'll kind of, this will be our you know last problem that we'll do today. I would love for you guys to give it a try. Recognize the fact that it is an exponential form and utilize what we just went over and give it a go. Privately chat on over to me, please. Your answer choice. So you are either throwing over A, B, C, or D. So I'll give you one minute or so. No pressure. I will only judge you as a human being and your entire self-worth rides on this problem. So good luck. Kidding. I joke. Or do I? I could be that crazy. I don't know. All right. Got some answers coming in. Don't rush, though, in all seriousness. Look for the key ideas there. Notice your answer choices first. That's where you're looking always when you're given an expression so that you can recognize, A, what topic is being you know, focused on, in this case, it's exponential functions, and B, so that you can then start to hone in on what you should be reading for in the question. All right, another 15-ish seconds. And then we'll take a break after that. Good, nice job, all right. Don't feel bad if you don't get to the answer choice in time. It's not a race. I realize that I'm crunching this down time-wise. Okay, all right. So whether you got to your answer choice or not, I hope that you did recognize a couple of things. I hope that you recognize it was y equals a times b to the x. I hope that you saw that there's a similarity in that a is two. So discount that from your mind. Disregard the two in the exact problem when you read over it. I hope you also noticed that there was a biggest difference was in the fact that your growth factor or decay factor differed and that D is linear. It does not have anything raised to a power. So not saying that D isn't your answer, but if you're a guessing person, you know, which one of these is not like the other one, which one of these is not the same. If you're a Sesame Street fan, uh, D would be in that category. So a cable company with a reputation for poor customer service, none of those exist in the world, is losing subscribers at a rate of approximately 3% per year. Losing, we are losing one minus 0 0.03, 100% minus 3%. Well, okay, it's not gonna be adding. That lost 3%, that's in play. This one right here is lost, has lost 30%, that's out. Now, how do we know it's not D? The fact that you have a repeated, this is my last point of the day, repeated percent, that indicates exponentiation, an exponential function. If you have a one-time percent, you go to a store, whatever store it might be, you pick your favorite store and it's a 25% off sale. That is only applied once. That would be linear. D is out, B is in, and you have yourselves a break. Guys, great job this week, really nice work. I will see you all, I see you guys in two weeks. Mr. Bars could be rocking it for two hours next week. Um, and then in two weeks, I'll be back to do the math bits. You will still get all of your notes ahead of time, like usual. The homework assignment, uh, we're going to be doing practice test number three. Uh, that is going to be coming across to you, though, in an email. So you don't even have to remember it. It comes to you in the email, just like last week did as well. All right, nice job. Take a minute, a strict minute. Uh, and to the person that said, thank you, you're welcome. That's very kind. My pleasure. I hope I did enough. That's what I always hope. All right, so Mr. Barth, how are you? Hey, I'm good. How are you? Really good. Yeah, really good. good. That I'm is good. Keeping extra focus of how I'm going to explain to Lorianne how to, because she's familiar with Zoom, but I'm yeah. like, there's certain things that I do. That I'm like, where do I click to make him close? Because I want to be right. sure. Right. Yeah. We'll figure it out one way or another. We'll we'll be able to handle it. It'll be good. It'll be great. Yeah. Thank you for flexibility again. That'll be a Sure. Fun. Of course. 
No I worries at all. I haven't seen them in like seven years. We used to do a Long Island family reunion every year. Oh, um, yeah. And then COVID and, you know, kids. Yeah. And some of them are older. That's like three generations, four generations mm-hmm. at one point. So yeah. That's, that's That'll great. be great. Yeah. It'll be so much fun. I'm good stoked. for you. Thanks. Yeah, good for you. Yeah. So how about you? How's life? Good. Yeah, things are good. Can't complain. That's awesome. Yeah. That's good. Awesome. Yeah. Very yeah, cool. all as well. Mm-hmm. Um, that's good. Great. Yeah. Well, then I will see you on Monday. We're swimming in, was that the 12th, right? 12th. Yes. Right? Yep. Yeah, right. that's, that's where our next meeting fun. is. Yeah, so I'm we're good. That. It's really fun. Yeah, it's not bad, it's right? It's oh, it's great. It's it's fun to be a part of something that is actually taking you know effect. You know. Yeah. Yeah, Maybe. isn't it? Feels good. I think so. Yeah. So. So. All right. Well, I'll see you, All right, buddy. Have a happy rest of the day. Your co-host. Thanks. Good. Yep. Right? Should awesome. be good. Awesome. All right. Later. See ya. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. All righty. Okay, guys, welcome back. It's good to be with you guys again, as always. Glad to be here with you for week two. Um, So we are going to jump right into uh, the next part of our review of the prep packet from last week. And if you see the agenda that's up there for you right now, I'm sure that's what you're reading. So our goal for this week is to finish our packet. Uh, We got about, uh, I would say like 40% of the way through for the reading section. And then we're going to cap that off today and then also get through as much of the writing and language as we can. Um, We probably won't get to, I know I asked you guys to do practice test one for this week. Um, Hopefully you did. Uh, We probably won't get to look at practice test one, but that's okay. Um, Because next week when I'm with you for two whole hours, we get two whole hours of, of, you know, English fun. um, We'll be able to go through all that stuff. So practice test one, practice test three, um, you know, finish up whatever other little things we have to do. We'll have a, well, a lot of stuff to get through, but it'll be good. It'll be a really good time. Um, so anyway, we might not get to my second item here on the agenda, but if not, that's okay. Regardless of that though, uh, your homework is to kind of just plow through and continue moving through the practice test. So just like Mr. Groden said, practice test three would be your homework for him. It's the same for me. Practice test three, both sections, reading and writing and language, please do them both. Um, and then we will, uh, we will take a look at those next week for sure. Go through all of them and start showing you guys, um, how these strategies and traps and tricks and everything I'm showing you, how it's all going to start paying dividends because you're going to see that at work, um, as we review through those two practice tests. All right. And that is pretty much it for our agenda. So why don't I stop sharing that and then jump back into the notes where we left off again, just as a reminder. Um, if you are taking some notes on the side, or if you printed out these notes, um, that would be great. If not, that's okay too, because you can always go back and watch the video on YouTube. All right. So if memory serves, we left off with this second bullet point right here. And the second sub bullet point, actually, where I told you guys that, um, I have bolded here, always identify adverbs and adjectives and be skeptical of them. We're going to talk about this today. Adjectives and adverbs, not that I want to make this into a grammar lesson, but adjectives and adverbs are very, very tricky, okay? I'm going to show you some examples of how. The trickiness when it comes to adjectives and adverbs is this. The more of them you have, the more nuanced and the more restricted the answer choice becomes, okay? So if you have a series of adjectives in an answer choice, let's say answer choice B has like two adjectives that are describing the same noun. What that means is that you need to be able to support those two adjectives with that same noun with evidence from the text. The problem with that is that the text is going to have to be just as specific as the answer choice was. So if the answer choice is using two adjectives to describe a similar noun, there better be evidence back in that text that accurately supports both of those adjectives working with that same noun. And the greater the number of adjectives or adverbs, that show up in an answer choice, the harder and harder and harder it becomes to prove that answer choice correct. So I'm going to show you some examples of that as we move into uh, this today. But, um, and I'll I'll bring this up again at that point, but I just want to remind you of that. Like, I'm not here to tell you that if an answer choice does contain an adjective or an adverb, or maybe even two adjectives or adverbs, I can't tell you 100% that that answer choice is wrong. What I can tell you is that the burden of proof on that answer choice is so much higher. So if it were up to me and I'm a guessing person and I'm like, okay, well, I don't know which one it is, either A or B, 
but I see that B has two adjectives that are describing the same noun or two adver two adverbs that are describing the same adjective or verb or whatever, and A does not, I'm going to guess A only because since A doesn't have that restriction on that language, it's, there's a greater likelihood that that answer choice can be proven with language from the text. Whereas answer choice B, which might contain more adjectives or adverbs, it's going to be harder for the text to prove that to be true. Okay. I'll show you some examples, like I said, never fear. All right, so let's go on to our next slide. And this kind of like works hand in hand with what this slide's about. Anytime you find extreme language, okay? Language that is very, very strong. You wanna be very skeptical of it. This first bullet point right here is amazing. It says right here, avoid absolutes. Now you might not know what the term absolute means, but I have some examples for you right here. Absolutes are words that indicate an absolute position in language. And what that means is this. They are saying that something is either always true or never true, okay? The problem with that type of language is that there are so few things in the universe which actually adhere to that type of dichotomy. Something can't always be true because there's always an exception to something that's always true. Something can never be true because there's always an exception to it never being true. Okay. I defy you to think of one thing other than like death, you know, that is an absolute in the universe. Like it's really, really hard to do that. So whenever you see those words, always and never, I mean, they're dead giveaways, but any of the words that I'm showing you right here in parentheses. So words like only, certainly, always and never, which we talked about completely, absolutely, undeniably, any word that you can see that does not allow for an exception to be made, that says that everything is going to be just like this, those are called absolutes. They are almost always incorrect. I have been through every single answer choice in all eight tests that the, that the SAT uh, College Board has released. I think one time, one time did a correct answer choice actually contain an absolute. Every other time there was an absolute in an answer choice, it was wrong. So I feel pretty confident in giving you guys that, that strategy right there to follow that like if you ever see any of that language, you want to get rid of that answer choice right away it is probably not going to be correct. So just cross it out. Okay. So working hand in hand with that is the second bullet point right here that says strong adjectives. We just talked about adjectives and adverbs and how they're bad. Strong adjectives, strong adverbs, and strong verbs, they are also not good. I'm going to let you in on a little secret here. College Board likes answer choices that are very plain and very boring, very vanilla, that don't have any kind of like extra fluff or superfluousness or anything like that. The plainer the answer, the more boring the answer, the better it is to choose. Okay, we saw some of that last week when I was showing you the difference between the key distractor and the right answer choice. The plainer one was the better answer, and that was the right answer. The key distractor, which had all like the bells and whistles and the flowery language, all that kind of stuff, that was the one that was the wrong answer choice. So you want to avoid answer choices that contain very strong language. Okay, give you an example. Let's say that an answer choice contains the word disgusting, like, I don't know, like answer choice B, like, you know, um, so-and-so had a disgusting habit, okay? The word disgusting has strong tonality assigned to it. If something is disgusting, it is utterly repulsive. You don't wanna be anywhere near it, okay? There's a real strength to that particular word, okay? Now, if you're telling me that answer choice B is correct, it's got that strong adjective in there describing something, recognize that the text itself has to be able to support the strength of the use of that adjective. So if I go back to the text and look for evidence, I better find evidence for something being utterly repulsive when it's describing whatever answer choice B is describing, okay? The likelihood of that happening is very, very low. Whereas if there are other answer choices that do not contain strong language like that, but language that's very plain or very boring, it's much more likely that you're going to find evidence support that type of language because it's broader, it's more generalized, it's easier to support. But answer choices that contain language that's very, very strong, that's tighter, it's smaller, it's harder to find evidence to support that. Okay, so you want to be careful whenever you see that kind of stuff, because if there's strong language in there, it's typically not a good thing. Okay, so just to summarize, 
adjectives, adverbs, prepositional phrases we'll get into a little bit later. I don't want to get into that just yet. I want to wait a little bit before we get into prep phrases, but I will come back to that. But adjectives and adverbs in general are difficult to support with text. So that's the main takeaway from what I'm trying to tell you right here. So try to avoid choosing options that contain one or more adjectives and adverbs because the more that are in there, the harder it is for that answer choice to be proven true. Okay. All right, let's see what else we got here. Here's a great one for you. This is one of these traps the SAT plays in you all the time. As a matter of fact, it just happened. I just saw Mr. Grodin go through this with you guys. So here's some crossover between the math and the English here. Okay. What you want to do is you want to be aware of the answer choice that is not like the others. If there's one answer choice that stands out because it's not like the three other answer choices that you have, that's called the outlier. The outlier typically isn't the right answer. What College Board is looking to do is they're looking to see how good a reader you are in the reading section. How good are you able to discern slight differences between answer choices that would say like, okay, you know, 75% of people choose this one, but only 25% of people choose this one. And this is the right answer. Because remember that between the key distractor and the right answer choice, they're gonna be very, very close to each other. The language is very close. The length of the answer choice is very, very close. So they're gonna make them close on purpose because they wanna see if you're a really good reader, you're able to tease out those subtle differences between the key distractor and the right answer to find out which one is the better option. Both could be good, but one is just slightly better. That being said, if there's an outlier, one that is least like the other three, that's a throwaway. That's never going to be correct, okay? Because they're looking to give you three options that are very similar and make you be the person to choose between the ones that are the most similar because that's going to prove to them how good a reader you actually are, okay? So take a look at this question that I have right here and these four options that are presented, all right? Now... If you look at A, B, C, and D here, don't worry about the answer to it, okay? Because the answer doesn't matter. I'm not even looking at this to try to say like, you know, can you figure out what the right answer is? Don't care about that. I want you to look at A, B, C, and D though, the way they're written here. One of them is least like the other. It's not about the language that's being used. It's not about the words that are included in the answer choice. But one of these options is least like the other in terms of the structure of the way it's written, okay? Look at the length of A, B, C, and D. Ask yourself, what does A, B, and D, what commonality exists in those three answers? If you look at A, B, and D, what's the commonality here? Well, look at this. A contains two lines of text, ends right about here. B also contains two lines of text, ends right about here, just a little bit later. D also contains two lines of text, ends right about here. See how close B and D are? You see that? They really are about the same length as each other. Now, if I'm a guessing person, all right, let's say I didn't read the passage, I know nothing about this, whatever, I'm running out of time, I gotta answer this question. I'm looking at B and D. I'm seeing how close they are. I'm looking at to see if there's language that's similar between B and D, because that might be then my key distractor and my right answer choice. So if I had to choose real quickly, I'm gonna look at this and say like, well, B and D are the same length as each other basically. So they're probably the two closest ones. And if they share similar language, they're definitely the two closest ones. But what I know for sure is this, A has two lines, B has two lines, D has two lines. Look at answer choice C. Look at how much longer answer choice C is. It's so much longer, in fact, that it contains three lines of text as opposed to just two lines of text that we saw in A, B, and D, okay? C then would be my outlier. C is the one that is least like the others because it is much longer than the other three that are present right there. A, B, and D are all roughly the same length, especially B and D, how close they are but C is the outlier because of its length. Me, when I'm looking at this, before I even begin to read any of the answer choices, I'm gonna look at C, I'm gonna notice its length, I'm gonna strike C out right away because I know that it's the outlier, it's probably not gonna be the correct answer. And then I'm gonna focus more of my attention on A, B, and D at that point, okay? Especially B and D because of how the length between the two of them is so close.
All right. So that's a quick and easy way just to get rid of one option right off the bat. And again, let's say that A, B, and D were two lines, but let's say that C was only one line of text. Well, that would still make C the outlier because now it's that much shorter than the other three options that are presented right there. So you want to look for the one that's different and recognize that's probably not the one that College Board wants me to choose because it's least like the others. And typically the one that's least like the others is not the correct answer itself. Okay, it's a very easy way just to kind of get rid of one answer right off the bat and then just be ha have three there at that point to choose from if you have to. Okay, easy little trick. Okay, now we're going to start getting into some strategies. All right, couple things I need you to recognize. This first bullet point up here is very, very important. It says you need to recognize that strategies are meant to lead you to the best answer choices, but they are not infallible. Okay, I want to make that claim right up front. I can't give you a single strategy that's going to work for you 100% of the time. Okay, if there was such a strategy that would work every single time, all the time, no matter what, everyone would know how to beat the SAT and people would be getting 800s every single day. Okay, that doesn't work out. Okay, there's not like that. But what I can tell you is that the strategies that I'm giving you will work for you the majority of the time. OK, there might be a time or two where they do fail you and you get the wrong answer. And you might say, but Mr. Barth, I followed the strategy. I, I did what you told me to do. 100 percent. I can believe that. OK. Trust the process, though, in that if a strategy I'm providing for you works 85 or 90 percent of the time, that's a good strategy because it's going to lead you to the correct answer. Then 85 to 90 percent of the time, I'll take those odds any day that those are great odds. Those other five to 10% of the times it doesn't work out for you. Okay. You know, sometimes it doesn't work. Okay. But you have to play the odds here and know that even if the strategy fails you once or twice, if it works for you eight or nine times outside of that, it's still a good thing to use. And you can't lose faith and say, you know what, because that strategy didn't work for me this time, I'm not doing it anymore. I'm better off just kind of like answering it myself. I don't know. I don't know. Because you, you have to be tactical. You have to be strategic when you take this test. Otherwise, you can't hope to score as high as you would otherwise. Okay? So just be careful about that. The number one thing you can do, though, to increase your success in trying to get the right answer is to look for the synonyms. Last week, I talked with you about this. Remember, I said, okay, you're choosing answer choice B. You're going to say that B is the right answer? Great. Show me the words. Show me the language. Go back into that passage and show me the language that shows that B is the right answer. I wanna see those words support that answer choice. If you can't show me the language, it can't be the right answer choice, no matter what. I'm gonna take you back real quickly and show you something, just to kind of highlight this and the importance of it all. Let's go back to practice test one. This is where we left off last week, okay? And you'll remember this, okay? Remember, we were looking at this one, number 35. This is the one where I asked you guys, can you choose between the key distractor and the right answer choice? We said that A and C were definitely out. Notice here too, DL choice A only has one line of text, but B, C, and D all have two. What would that make A? The outlier. That's why I knew A was out. A was going to be out right away. C, definitely out as well. So then we were left with B and D as our two options. Cool. We saw that the language between B and D was very close because here in D we had sons of educated men, right? And in B we had sons of educated men. So there's that closeness in language. That shows me right away, that's a clue that I'm dealing with my key distractor and my right answer choice. All right, good stuff, all right? Look at the length of B and D. B ends right here, D ends right here. They are pretty tight in terms of their length, again, Key distractor, right answer choice. That's looking good. But to my point about synonyms, it is this. When we went back to the paragraph and we looked for evidence for B, we found all of this procession of the sons of educated men. We found exactly this language. Okay. If we go back up to here, right, it was line six through 10. Look, here's the language the procession of the sons of educated men. It's all right there. So we got like a word for word replication of things. That's great. That's what we needed. All right. If we looked at D though, we didn't see symbolic. We couldn't find language to support that. There was no synonym for it. We couldn't find language to support legacy. 
There was no language to support the words past and present. So all of that extra stuff that was added in there made it impossible because we couldn't find anything to support that. People liked the way that D sounded. They said it sounded really, really good, but there was no language. So you have to resist the temptation to say like, I like the way this looks. I like the way this sounds. No, no, no. Can you find the words? If you can find the words, it's great. If you can't find the words, it's not so great. And that's where we run into problems. So that's what I mean by synonyms, okay? Because we can use all our other strategies to try to like, you know, get rid of certain answer choices and narrow down where it should be and all that kind of good stuff and all that's great. But at the end of the day, you have to be able to provide synonyms in order for the answer to be correct. And with choice B, we were able to find that exact same language. So that's pretty close then. That's exactly what we needed. And I just wanted to illustrate that point for you quickly before jumping ahead. Okay, so we're gonna go back to our notes. My bullet point down here, this third bullet point says, always read a full sentence or two above and below the lines you're being given in order to get an assessment of context. Context is everything in this text, all right? So here's what I mean. Let's say they're giving you like line nine through 11. They want you to look at those lines. That's in the question, like reread lines nine through 11, and then boom, a question will follow after that. What most students will do is they'll just focus on nine through 11. Now the answer is gonna be in the lines they tell you it's gonna be in for sure. It will be there, but there might be some valuable context that exists prior to line nine or that exists after line 11. And if you don't read a full sentence or two before line nine begins and a full sentence or two after line 11 begins, you might miss out on important context that can really help you to get to the right answer. OK, so don't just focus purely on the lines they give you. You want to look a little bit before and a little bit ahead of those lines just to get a sense of that context. And you might even find help in, in getting to the right answer in that contextualization. All right. It's an easy thing to do. It takes you no more than like 10 seconds to read a little bit before the lines and a little bit after the lines. OK, another bullet point here. Always read the headings and the footnotes of the infographics when they're presented to you because they contain important information as well. I'm gonna pull up an infographic and show you what I mean by this. It's much easier to explain when you actually see it in front of you. So we're gonna go back to practice test one again. Let me zoom out a little bit here so you can see it better. Let me go back this way. Okay, actually, let me do this one right here. Great, all right, see this right here? Okay, this bar graph that we have, this is an infographic question. There aren't many strategies you can use for infographic questions because they're all very unique. You might get a bar graph, you might get a pie chart, you might get a table, it could be anything. And all the data that's in those is very, very unique to the, the type of passage that you're reading. So it's hard to give like a strategy that will work for any infographic question when the infographic questions are all very individualized, okay? However, one thing I can tell you is this, what most students tend to do is they focus on the infographic and they try to decipher the data. In this case, they'll look at like the X and Y axis right here and then look at the bars and see like, okay, these are the giver stuff. This is the recipient stuff. They'll focus purely on this information that's located in here. Okay, that's what they do. What they avoid is looking at this, which is the header. They just ignore it. Like they don't look at it and they don't read it. Or they'll ignore looking at the key that's right here or the legend or the footnotes. They ignore all that stuff, okay? That's a mistake because what College Board says is that not just the infographic itself, but anything located within this quadrant of the page right here, all of this stuff, the header, the footnote, whatever it might be, the legend, if there's a legend there, all of it is considered eligible content. And what that means is they could ask you a question and the answer to that question could be in the header itself, not in the bar graph at all. Or they could ask you a question and it might be in the key down here and not the bar graph either. So you wanna be careful to make sure that you look at all this when you're trying to answer a question. Because if you see the infographic question right here, like number 21, 21 says the authors would likely attribute the differences in gift giver and recipient mean appreciation as represented in the graph to what? What would they attribute that to? 
The answer was A, an inability to shift perspective. See this word perspective right here. That's important. Look at what the header is. Givers perceived and recipients actual gift appreciations. We have perceived or perception. And then in this answer choice A right here, we have an inability to shift perspective. There's a closeness assigned to what's happening right there. It would be very difficult for you to read this bar graph and try to deduce what the answer is to question 21 that we just did. Had you not looked for the information that's located here in the header and recognize like, well, if someone perceives something, it has to also be a part of their perspective. So when I see perceive, and then down here, I see, okay, perspective, there is a link. There's a link there that I need to appreciate. So I'm gonna go with answer choice A because that seems to be the closest evidence I can find to support any of these answer choices that are right here, all right? All that is to say, just don't discount the header and the footnotes. If we look at the one that comes up here, right? See this stuff right down here? This is simply a footnote. All this little type text right down here, this little, uh, this tiny font, this is a footnote. There could be a question about that. This right here, this could also, there could be a question about that information right there. So I don't want you to discount it because most people, what they'll do is they'll just focus on this table and they'll try to get all the information from the table. And that's all they're looking at is like, okay, let, it, let me do math. Let me figure some stuff out. Let me add or subtract or see what the difference is or whatever it might be. Sure, it might be there. That's, for, that's definitely the case, but it could be located in either one of these locations and you wouldn't even think to look there. Okay, so don't let that be something that stops you. All right, let's jump back to our notes here. Great. All right, paired questions. We talked about this a little bit last week when I showed you the chronology trick, okay? And I told you that like paired questions are the most numerous question type that you're going to face. Anywhere from 16 to 24 of the 52 questions in the reading test could actually be pairs. So there's no other question type that you're gonna face that's as numerous as paired questions, okay? Now, the tricky thing about paired questions is that since they're relying on each other because the answer to one affects the answer to the other, if you get one wrong, you tend to get the other one wrong as well. That's just how it is because they're paired with each other, all right? But if you think about it this way, if I get one right, my chances of getting the other one right are that much higher. So what did we talk about last week? Number one, use chronology, right? Find the question before it that contains your lower limit. Find the question after the paired questions that contains your upper limit. Look at the second part of the pair because that's going to have there the line references and those line references should exist in between your lower limit and your upper limit, okay? And the one that does, that's probably gonna be your right answer. So chronology is your first thing that you wanna do. And in using that chronology, it's going to make sure that you actually answer the second part of the pair first, not the first part of the pair. Let me just jump back real quickly and show this again. I'm not gonna to spend too much time on it, but I just wanna review it for your sake so everyone remembers what we talked about because this is so, so valuable. Okay. All right, yeah, let's zoom out a little bit. Remember, this was our this was our setup. This is what we talked about. So number 12, this was our lower limit. We had line 10 right here. So we knew we weren't gonna go below line 10, okay? Number 15, here was our upper limit, line 17 to 34. So we knew we weren't gonna go beyond 17 to 34. So our paired questions, 13 and 14, were in between 12 and 15. That was our perfect chronology setup right there. So what was our answer? What was the only one that was gonna let, exist between those two? It had to be A, 10 through 13, okay? And we assumed that 10 through 13 was the correct answer because it was the only value that existed between the lower limit and the upper limit. So we went with that one. So what did we do right there? We answered the second part of the pair first. And then we, were, we went back and we looked at 10 through 13. We highlighted the text right here. And then we went to 13 and we said, okay, did I have any language in 10 through 13 that matched what's in the question itself? Yes, because we saw a gift giving in 10 through 13. So we knew we were on the right track. Then in the answer choices, did I see anything that looked similar to whatever else I saw in 10 through 13? 
Yup, because we saw strength in a relationship and we saw the word stronger. We saw one's closest peers. So we knew we were on the right track and we took D as our right answer for number 13. And that is correct. So what did we do? We used chronology. We answered the second part of the pair first. We went back and highlighted that text. And then we looked to see what could we see in the question itself that was similar and which of the answer choice had the most language that was similar to what we highlighted in 10 through 13. And that was it. And that's how we got through the pairs. Okay. Now, remember, it's not always going to be that you have a perfect chronology set up. Okay. So you're not always going to have line reference question, paired questions, line reference question. It doesn't happen like that all the time. But when it does, you can rely on this technique because that's going to help out. That's going to help you out tremendously. Okay. So just keep that in mind. Paired questions can be tricky, but the better you get with them, the more practice you get with them, you're going to be able to move through them that much more quickly, and they will not nearly affect your score as much as if you're using just kind of like your brain to kind of get through them and doing them in chronological order and not paying attention to chronology. It's going to wear you down. So you want to use as many skills as you can to help yourself get through those paired questions, knowing how many of them are going to come on the test, because it can be a lot. Okay. All right, let's jump back into our notes again. All right. The other thing you want to do is you want to fully analyze the question you're being asked. You want to know what you're being asked. I know that sounds like it's a pretty obvious thing. Like, well, of course, I know what I'm being asked because I read the question. A lot of times people don't. They think they know what they're being asked, but they're not paying attention to it. And the way that you want to look at this is if a question that you're being given is multi-part, Okay, let's say it's a long question and the question is actually two parts. The first part is a statement and the second part is actually the question. If ever that happens, you want to pay attention to what's being asked of you. Let me show you what I mean by that. We're going to go back to practice test one again and we're going to go to question 23. Let's scroll down here. Okay, here's 23. I'm going to zoom in to make it easier for you. Great. All right, looking at 23, look at the length of this question. See how long it is? I mean, we got like four lines of a question here. That's a pretty long question. Also, notice that it's two parts. The first part right here, the first part is actually just a statement. That's a sentence by itself. And then the second part is the question. If ever this occurs, there's a reason why it occurs. College Board does not make mistakes with the wording of stuff. They are very, very specific in how they word things, and they always word things for a reason. So what you want to pay attention to are these, three, are these two things. Are there any adjectives or adverbs or verbs, too? Verbs are actually a good one. Adjectives, adverbs, and verbs. Are there any of those that show up in the question, especially a question of this length? The answer for that for this is yes. Look at the first one here. It says, a student claims that nitrogenous bases pair randomly with one another. Randomly is an adverb. Most words that end in L-Y are adverbs, okay? So if I was reading through this question, I would highlight this or underline it or circle it or something because I know there's a reason why they put that in there. You do not use adverbs by mistake, okay? They don't happen automatically. You have to know that you're using it for a purpose. So I would say, okay, randomly, that's gonna be an important thing, fine. Look at the question now. The question says, which of the following statements in the passage contradicts, that's a verb, the student's claim? Well, we just found out that the student claimed that these nitrogenous bases paired randomly with each other. So this is now asking me, well, what contradicts that? What is the opposite of that? The, to contradict something is to say the opposite of it or to go against it. That's why paying attention to the verb is so important. So what contradicts randomness? Well, think about this. If we're thinking about something that's random, it's gotta be like disorderly, chaotic, uh, difficult to predict, Something like that, because like, it's random. You don't know when it's going to happen or when it's not going to happen. That's what that's the essence of randomness. Fine. So what would be the opposite of that? Predictability, orderliness, knowing something's going to occur. All those things would be the opposite of random. Now that we know that, we would go through each of these different options right here. Lines 5 and 6, 9 and 10, 23 to 25, 27 to 29. We'd go through all of them and say, okay, can we find evidence 
of something that is the opposite or the contradiction of randomness. We got to find language that would suggest the opposite of randomness because we paid attention to this adverb, figured out what that meant, and knew that this verb had to be the opposite of that because that's what the student claimed. That's what I mean about knowing the question because if you were, if you read through this and you're like, I don't know, and then you just start like looking at five and six, nine and 10, 23 and 25, you don't really know what you're looking for. You're just like, I'll find something that sounds good and just like hope that I choose the right answer. That can't be the way that you approach this. Instead, whenever a question is this long, you really got to start breaking it down, taking it out chunk by chunk and piece by piece and figuring out what do they want me to do here? I got to know what my mission is. That's why I want you to pay attention to adjectives, adverbs, and verbs because they're being put in there for a reason. So look at this. Again, we're going to try to find out, do we have an, a, an example here? Lines that contain evidence of the opposite of randomness. So predictability, orderliness, anything like that. If we look at 27 through 29, which we're going to do right now, all right, 27 to 29. That is, here's 25, 26, 27. Okay, here we go. Here's 27 to 29. I just highlighted it for you. See if you can figure this out for me. Is there any word in these lines that I just highlighted? You can type in an answer if you feel so brave. Is there any word in these lines that I just highlighted that you think would indicate the opposite of randomness? So again, I'm looking for language that would suggest something that's orderly or something that's predictable that we know is going to happen because that would be the opposite of randomness. Just plug something in if you think that you know some language in there that would help to suggest that. Give me about five more seconds. You are all hitting it out of the park with it. Yeah, the word must. If something must occur, it is the opposite of randomness. You can't say that it must happen and then it's gonna be random. No, because if it must occur, it is guaranteed to occur. So therefore it is the opposite of randomness. That is the answer here. If we were to look at five and six, nine and 10, 23 to 25, we would not find another word that showcased the opposite of randomness. But you know what we would find? We would find nitrogenous bases. We'd find this language right there, present in a lot of those different line options. It's also present in 27 to 29. It is there for sure. But if we didn't pay attention to that adverb and this verb right here and think, okay, well, what's the opposite of randomness? We'd be screwed because it's like, I don't know what I'm looking for. I'm just going to guess something now because I'm perplexed. The reason why you're perplexed is because you don't know what the question's asking you. You got to start breaking these longer questions apart because the longer they are, the more complicated they are. But those adjectives, those adverbs, and those verbs, those are the key things to pay attention to because they're definitely used for a reason, okay? So don't let that be something to stop you from getting the right answer. Good job on that, though. You guys did great with that. Okay. All right, so we did analyzing the question that's being asked. Some more strategies. All right. Like I told you last week, there will come a time where you have to simply guess all your strategies are gonna fail you. You simply don't know what the answer is. You're running out of time. This is not the ideal scenario to be in, but it happens. So we have to be able to prepare for it. There's gotta be a measure of preparedness. Here is something you can do that can help you prepare for that eventuality, okay? I wanna point out though that I never advocate using this technique as your first shot. This is your last shot that you take, okay? And only in those scenarios that I just referenced. You're running out of time. No other strategy has been able to kind of like confidently make you feel as though you're, get it, you're gonna guess the right answer and you simply have to move on, all right? If that is the case, you can use this. All right, if you are in either the literature section or the social studies section, Shorter answer choices are better than longer answer choices, okay? So if there are two options, let's say I was able to narrow it down to a 50-50. I happen to be in the literature section, which if you remember, I said last week, literature is always the first passage you do. Always, that never changes. Let's say I'm in the literature section. I got rid of B and D because I knew they were terrible. I'm with A and C, okay? I only have a couple seconds left. I got to choose something. I don't have time anymore to implement strategies. So I'm going to say, all right, I'm going to use my last ditch effort. Here's where it is. If I'm in literature and I see that like, well, option A is shorter than option 
C? I'm going to guess A. Here's the reason for that. In the humanities, which literature and social studies are considered humanities subjects, in the humanities, we always believe that less complicated language, shorter sentences, word conciseness, all those types of things, that is usually better because there's less of a chance for your message to be misinterpreted if the language is simpler and easier to digest, okay? That means if you have shorter options, shorter sentences to choose from, it's a greater likelihood that that's going to be correct over one that's longer and more complicated, okay? Not only are shorter options better because you have less words in them, remember that's less words than they had to find synonyms for back in the passage to be able to prove that one to be true, okay? But also if there are fewer words there, it's a simpler answer in general. There's a less of a chance that you're gonna read that and think, I don't know what I just read. A longer answer choice you might stumble along the way and think, I don't know what I just read, okay? And that's not the best. That's not what you want in these scenarios, okay? So again, literature, social studies, shorter answers versus longer answer, I'm choosing the shorter answer if I have to guess because usually that's gonna work out in my favor. I would say 60-40. It's not as good as some of the other strategies. I can submit that to you totally. But if I have to guess, I'm guessing it like that, knowing that still the odds are on my side. Now, if you're in a science section, the opposite is actually true. Longer answer choices tend to be right more of the time over shorter answer choices, okay? The reason for that is this. Science is a data-driven field. The more data you have, the more explanation that's there, the greater the likelihood is that whatever it is you're trying to prove is actually true, okay? Because science just thrives on data. That's what makes things provable in science. Okay, so longer answer choices then, answer choices that contain more information are more likely to be true in those scenarios. So if we were right back to where I just took us with our previous, uh, previous conversation about this, we're in a science section, we got rid of options B and D, knew that they were both incorrect. We gotta move forward, we can't wait anymore. Strategies are simply exhausted. Okay, option A is shorter. Option C is longer. I recognize I'm in the science section and I'm going to guess, I'm going to guess option C because it's the longer one and it's probably going to be the right answer. Okay. So just something that you can use in your back pocket if you find yourself in that type of situation. I know it's not a great place to be, but you got something that might work to your favor if you have to pull that out. Okay. Another thing to consider is this. Plural nouns, that is nouns that are not singular, so more than one. Okay, recognize that plural nouns by their very nature are more complicated than singular nouns. Therefore, they are harder to prove true. I know it doesn't seem like much of a difference, like, you know, okay, the word man versus men. So man is singular, men is plural. Is there really that much of a difference? Like there's just one man versus two, right? It doesn't seem like there's that much, but there is a difference, especially on this test. I'm gonna show you how in a second. We are going to go to question 41 in practice test one so I can highlight this for you. All right, let me just scroll there. Apologies for the scrolling. All right, take a look at this. Look at question 41 here, all right? So question 41 says this, the range of places and occasions listed in lines 72 through 76. So we would know to go back here and look at these lines, but again, get some context. So read a little bit before 72, a little bit after 76, just to get that context in your mind. So the range of places and occasions mainly serves to emphasize how, and now we have our four options here. Okay, take a look at the plural nouns that are located in these options. What do we got here? Option A. How novel the challenge faced by women, well, women is plural, woman with an A is singular, women with an E is plural, fine. So that's one plural noun there, great. Or emphasize how pervasive the need for critical reflection is. Well, the only noun, well, needs a noun, right? But that's singular. Reflection is also a noun, also singular. No plural nouns in option B. Okay, C. Complex, the political and social issues, that's a plural noun because issue would be singular, of the day are, or D, enjoyable the career possibilities, plural, for women, plural, are. 
Okay. So here, what do we have? We had one plural noun in A, no plural nouns in B, all singular, one plural noun in C, one plural noun in D, or I'm sorry, two plural nouns in D, possibilities and women. So two plural nouns right there. All right. Take a look at these options right here. Before we even begin to get into the plural noun thing, there is one option here that's least like the others. Which one is that? We just went over this about a half hour ago. Which one is what? Which one do I know is my outlier? Type it in if you can tell me what the outlier is. We talked about this earlier, structural outliers. Which one is least like the others? Let's see what people are choosing. C is correct. Yes, C is a structural outlier, okay? Because two lines of text. Every other one, one line of text. So C already looks bad, all right, for that reason. Not only that, I want to go back to another thing that we talked about earlier. Remember I told you about adjectives? Remember I said like, hey, if there's an answer choice that contains two adjectives that are linked to a noun, that's typically bad. Well, look at what we have with C. Political is an adjective. Social is an adjective. What are they modifying? They're modifying the word issues right here. So political issues, those types of issues, and social issues, those types of issues. Okay, here's the reason why adjectives are terrible. I'm gonna prove this to you right now. Let's say we went back and we read 72 through 76. Cool, we got all that information. We know what that's all about right there. All right, now let's say we're choosing C. We think I like C, even though it's the outlier, all right, whatever. I like C, I'm gonna think that C is the right answer. Here's how hard it is to prove C correct. 72 through 76, those five lines of text right there, they need to contain political and social issues. If they only contain political issues in 72 through 76, then C is wrong because social issues weren't listed and social issues were part of the answer choice. If they only contain social issues and not political ones, then C is wrong again because political was left out, but social issues were mentioned. If they only contain one political and social issue, then C is wrong again because it says issues here and we need more than one. But 72 to 76 only contained one political and social issue. So C is wrong again. You see what happens with this. Whenever you have two adjectives, that are stacked, it's called adjective stacking. Whenever you have two adjectives like this that are stacked with a noun, especially if it's a plural noun, it becomes so hard to prove it to be true because there's so many opportunities for it to not be true. The text can't be that good. It can't be that replete with synonyms over the course of five lines of text that it's like, yep, I'm gonna account for both political and social issues. All those things are gonna be accounted for in five lines of text. Probably not. The burden of proof for something like that is just way too high. So C is a terrible answer for all types of reasons. It's an outlier. It's got two adjectives that are stacked to a plural noun. Three reasons why I would never choose C, okay? Because of how many strikes it has against it. C is out as an option right there. All right, so what are we left with then? We're left with A, B, and D. So if we considered A, we would go back and read 72 through 76, fine. Novel the challenge faced by women is. Well, let's say 72 through 76 only mentions one woman. If it only mentioned one woman in 72 through 76, then A is wrong because A says women and women plural is different than woman singular. It can be just that slight. I've seen College Board do this a million times before, guys. Believe it or not, they are just that persnickety where they will do these types of things. So A would be wrong in that case, okay? How about D? We go back and read 72 through 76. Enjoyable the career possibilities for women are. Well, if it only mentioned one woman, then D is out. If it only mentioned one career possibility, then D is also out it would have to mention both career possibilities for multiple women in order for D to be correct. So the correct answer for this one is choice B, okay? And choice B just happens to contain no plural nouns, all singular nouns. It's the easiest one to prove. I don't want you to think though that just because an answer choice contains plural nouns, it's automatically wrong. That would be a bad way to look at this. What I am telling to tell you is this though. The more plural nouns an answer choice has, the more harder it is to prove to be true, the harder it is to find evidence to prove its validity, okay? 
if an answer choice only contains singular noun, it's that much easier to prove it to be true, and therefore it's that much more likely to be the right answer. Okay, so again, if I'm looking at things to guess and I'm saying like, okay, I don't know which one it is. Let's say I got rid of both C and A and I'm left with B and D. Okay, and I got to guess between the two of them. Maybe something that clicks in my head is, well, D contains two plural nouns and B contains none. I'm going to guess B. Sure, that's a valid way to approach this because you're using the strategy then of recognizing that plural nouns by their very nature are more complex and therefore more difficult to prove true. Whereas B, which contains no plural nouns, slightly easier to prove true. So the odds would be in your favor in choosing B in that situation. Okay, so something to consider for sure. But trust me, you will come across correct answer choices that contain plural nouns. There's, there's no way that that's not going to happen. Okay. I just want to give you this though as something to consider if you have to guess in certain situations and to help you kind of limit down your choices when you get to that point. Okay, good stuff. Let's jump back to the notes again. We are almost finished here. All right, so this may be the last thing that we do for today. And if so, that's totally fine because we will definitely get through everything next week. So what I'm gonna give you right now are very common question setups that you're likely to face in the reading test. I've already shown you one of them because we went through paired questions, okay? So you already know one of the most common question setups. This is another one that's very common that you are likely to see. As a matter of fact, you already did see this because you did practice test one. And you'll see it again in practice test three. This setup is called the infinitive setup. Now that's my, that's my classification. I've labeled it like that. The SAT calls it the author's purpose question, but I think that that might be a little bit too in the weeds for you guys. So I call it the infinitive setup because if you look at the way it's, it's constructed, it looks like an infinitive. Here is a sample infinitive setup question. So the authors refer to work by camera and others in order to, see how it ends with the word to right here? That's, a, that's one of the key things for it to be an infinitive setup question. So in order to, Offer an explanation, introduce a question, question a motive, support a conclusion. Now, what do you need for an infinitive? You should know this from foreign language class because no matter which foreign language you took, I guarantee they started with infinitives. The infinitive is the word to plus a verb. Same thing in English, okay? To plus a verb always equals an infinitive, okay? To run, to jump, to play, to walk, to sing, whatever. They're all infinitives. And then you conjugate the verbs from there. So what do we have right here? The question stem ends with the word to, and then each of the options begins with a particular verb. That's why it's an infinitive set of question. So if you see a question come up like this, you can use the strategy that I'm about to give to you because it works for infinitive set of questions in order to limit your options for you much, much easier than if you have to go through and try to figure it out on your own using your own knowledge. All right. The first thing that you want to do when you come across an infinitive set of questions is you want to take a look at each of these different verbs. Okay, what does it mean to offer something? What does it mean to introduce something? What does it mean to question something? And what does it mean to support something? Okay, I'm sure every one of you in here knows what each of these verbs mean. You probably used them before for sure. Okay, but you got to think to yourself, can I define what they mean? You know, can I say what it means to offer something? Sure, to offer something is to give it. Okay, can I say what it is to introduce something? Yeah, it's to kind of, you know, well, how else do you say it? It's introduce something, like something that's close to that, right? What is it to question something, to be skeptical of it, to not take it seriously, to think, I don't know about this, right? What does it mean to support something, to be a fan of something, a proponent of that particular thing? Okay, whatever. It doesn't have to be scientific. doesn't have to be how the dictionary does it. You just got to know what they are. What you want to determine, though, when you look at each of the verbs is, okay, are any of these verbs very different than the other verbs. That is also to say, are there any two verbs here that are very similar to each other? So if we look at offer and introduce and question and support, is there one verb that stands out as being very different in terms of what it means? Yeah. Are there any verbs here that are very similar in terms of what they're trying to communicate? Yes, that's true as well. It might not be immediately apparent to you what that is, and that's okay. I'm going to give you right now a foolproof method, which will always, always, always work for you. If you can't immediately discern which verbs are very similar to each other and which verbs are not like the ones that are similar to each other, here's what I want you to do. 
I want you to put all four of the verbs in some type of imaginary hypothetical context that you're aware of, that you know very well. I'll use myself as an example. I'm an English teacher, okay? So maybe I say something about, um, uh, you know, like I wanna do a new book with my students. Okay, we're gonna start a new novel, okay? And I'm gonna give them homework. So I'm gonna say, all right, well, here's some extra credit. So I'm gonna use that as my example. I'm going to offer my students extra credit. Okay, I know what that means. Like if I'm gonna say I'm gonna offer my students extra credit, I know what that means. I'm gonna give them an opportunity to do some extra credit. That's essentially what that means. I'm gonna introduce my students to some extra credit. That's the same thing. If I'm offering them extra credit, if I'm introducing them to some extra credit, it's the same thing. I'm giving them the opportunity to do it. So because of that, when I put it in that context, it revealed to me that offer and introduce actually are very similar in terms of how you're trying to use them in a sentence. Uh, if I'm offering extra credit or introducing extra credit, I'm doing the same thing regardless. The situation has not changed. What happens when I get to see? I'm going to question my students some extra credit. Doesn't that sound weird? That's not at all like offer and introduce. That's very different than what I just said. So question is, 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 strange. It's, it's, it's an outlier in this particular case because it's not like offer and introduce. I didn't have to change anything about my sentence when I made it in order to use offer and introduce, but I'm going to question my students' extra credit. Now I'm saying something entirely different than get, giving them an opportunity to do some extra credit. Okay. How about support? I'm going to support my students' extra credit. That's not as bad as, as question but it's not as close as offer and introduce was because what I said was, I'm gonna offer you some extra credit. I'm gonna to introduce to you some extra credit. That's so close to each other right there. Only a little bit changes. So these two are the closest. A and B would be the closest right there. I would get rid of C because that was my outlier. And D simply didn't, it's not nearly as close as these two either. So I would get rid of D as well. So both question and support are out. Now I'm at a 50-50. Now all I have to do, since I know that offer and introduce are pretty much the same, okay, because I just proved that when I used my hypothetical context, I proved that they were kind of the same. They were communicating the same thing. I don't even need to pay attention to them because those two verbs are the similarity between A and B. They are the two things that are very, very similar. So they don't need to be considered. All I need to consider now is this. Did I see an explanation or did I see a question? That's it. Okay. It's that simple because I was able to get rid of options C and D, knowing that those verbs just threw them out into left field. They were never going to be correct. Okay. The two verbs that were very interchangeable were offer and introduce. So don't consider them anymore because I know my answer is probably going to be between A and B. All I look for now when I go back to the text and I look in the passage is did I see an explanation back there or did I see a question back there? Whichever one that turns out to be an explanation or a question. There's my answer. I got it. Okay. So I think it could be really, really helpful to use this for infinitive setup questions because this way you know how to start eliminating answer choices right off the bat. All you have to remember to do is put the four verbs into that hypothetical context. So whether you're like a baseball player or a gymnast or, you know, you're uh, an artist or, or a musician, whatever it might be. Just make up some silly context that's totally imaginary, totally hypothetical. Put those four verbs in a context with it and see which two verbs work best with each other where you don't have to change up too much. There's usually going to be two and then there's going to be two others that are terrible and they don't, they don't work at all. Okay. All right. Guys, I think that's a great place to stop for now. We only have, let me see, how many more slides? Just about five more slides to get through and then we're done with the notes. What I want you to do again, just to recap real quickly, please make sure to do practice test three. Next week, what we'll do then is we'll finish up these notes. We'll take a look at practice test one and practice test three. And I'll start showing you how all these tricks and traps and strategies that we've been going over for the past two weeks, how they finally pay some dividends because you're going to see them at work when we start to go through those questions. Okay, that's all I have for you guys. Thanks so much, everybody. I will see you next week. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.